There's been so much discussed about Henry Ford in the Model T, but not enough has been discussed about Henry Ford II, his grandson, who really made Ford what it is today. So I thought I'd do a video just about his grandson, Henry Ford II. Enjoy. In 1943, a shocking event shook the automotive world. Henry Ford's only son, Etzel Ford, and the sitting president of Ford Motors unexpectedly died of stomach cancer at the age of 49. The largest family-owned company in America had just lost their leader. And the next in line to the Ford Motor Company, Edsel's eldest son, Henry Ford II, wasn't even in Michigan. In fact, he wasn't even in America. He was somewhere in the ocean on a naval warship fighting in World War II. Times were tough at the Ford Motor Company. Sales had stopped due to the war, and Henry Ford I, though still alive, was 80 years old and going downhill fast. Most assume Ford Motors was on its last legs. However, in an incredible turn of events, Etzel Ford's son, Henry Ford II, would not only come in and save the company from financial collapse, but in his 33 years as boss, would take it into the modern age, revolutionizing Ford even beyond its glory days of the Model T. This is the seldom told story of Hank the Deuce, the grandson of Henry Ford, who had just as much of an impact on Ford Motors, if not more, than his grandfather Henry Ford, and who would lead Ford Motors into a new era of dominance. Henry Ford's grandson, Henry Ford II, also called Hank, and sometimes even Hank the Deuce, was born on the 4th of September, 1917 in Detroit, Michigan. When Hank the Deuce was only two years old, his father Edsel took over Ford Motors as president. However, to say that Edsel actually was running the company would be a huge overstatement. The truth is, Henry Ford had stepped down to let his son be president, but president in name only, and Henry Ford was still the leading force. When key decision times came for Edsel, the board would then confer with his father Henry before any real action was taken. Edsel had four kids, with his oldest taking his father's name, Henry. Young Henry and his siblings enjoyed a childhood of incredible luxury and wealth, thanks to their grandfather's massive success and ambition. Graduated from the prestigious Hotchkiss School in 1936 and attended Yale University, where he served on the business staff of the Yale Record, a campus humor magazine. Simply put, Hank wasn't really at Yale to learn. He wanted to have fun. In fact, he never graduated from Yale after he got caught cheating. But it didn't matter to Hank. He still got on the payroll at Ford Motors doing odd jobs. In 1941, when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor and drew America into the vortex of the Second World War, Hank enlisted into the United States Navy. And while death and destruction would surround Hank on the warships, the news of his father's unexpected passing due to stomach cancer would be the biggest blow of all. While on a warship in August of 1943, he was handed a letter that his father had died and he needed to come back to Michigan immediately. Hank was just 26 years old, and though he was in line to take over Ford Motors, Hank never expected it to happen so soon. He had no real experience with a car company, or any kind of real professional business experience for that matter. And what's more, due to the war, Hank wasn't immediately able to get back to America to take over as president. So Hank's grandfather, Henry Ford, at 80 years old, had to reassume the head mantle again and became president of Ford Motors again. But things didn't go well. While Henry Ford had been the most brilliant business mind of his generation, he was frail, and his age had crippled his mind due to a stroke. And during the war, Ford Motors wasn't even making cars, as they were helping to make tanks, airplanes, and other military equipment. They were hemorrhaging money. From 1931 to 1941, their profits had been zero. And during the war, they were losing 10 million per month, the equivalent of over 200 million today. President Roosevelt had considered commandeering Ford Motors, and senior executives were discussing no confidence votes against Henry Ford in an attempt to take the company away from the 80-year-old. Hank the Deuce came home from the Navy and walked into the worst possible situation. He was set up for failure in every way, and the fate of Ford Motors would rest solely on his shoulders. When Hank came home from the war, he was facing a crisis on every front, with the most dangerous one being from within Ford Motors. 
First, Henry Ford had turned over too much control to his personal bodyguard turned violent henchman, Harry Bennett, a man that Hank despised and also feared. Secondly, three Ford executives, led by Ernest Breach, sought to take control of the Ford Motor Company on their own. As Etzel Ford had laid dying, they were already leading a campaign to reduce the Ford family influence over the company. On many occasions, both Henry Ford's wife Clara and Etzel's wife Eleanor were fighting for the company. All of this posed a major hurdle for Henry Ford II, and it would be a massive test for the 26-year-old's ability to handle corporate politics. And yet, he handled it expertly. First, Henry Ford II had to get his grandfather's blessing and signature that he was indeed the rightful heir to the company. Once that was accomplished, he proceeded to fire everyone at the top level of Ford Motors, including violent Harry Bennett, who pulled a gun on him. However, all of this didn't go down well with non-Ford family investors, who could see that the 26-year-old was clearly in over his head. So Hank rounded all the investors up at the Hennessy Restaurant in Michigan, and Hank's leadership was put on full display as he addressed the small group of holdout shareholders. The meeting was threatening and contentious, but in the end, Henry Ford II successfully thwarted the takeover attempt and won all the votes to stay in charge. But getting put into power was only a first step. There were serious problems all over Ford Motors. Instead of cars, Ford had been manufacturing tanks, planes, and military vehicles for the war. And getting back into vehicle production would take time and cost a lot of money. Not to mention, it would require designing, testing, and innovating new types of cars. No one was going to go back to buying old, pre-war, mid-30s cars again. Ford needed a new vision for the future. Hank could have taken the easy way out. He could have sold the Ford Motor Company for the billions that it was worth, and he and all the Fords could have lived a quiet life of luxury. But Hank wasn't that type of person. My name's on the building, he said. So young Henry rolled up his sleeves, sat at his desk, and set out to return his father and grandfather's company to the glory days of old. Now in a firm position of leadership, and with no senior staff having fired his grandfather's entire entourage, Hank turned to the place he knew, the military. He hired 10 young, promising upstarts from the Air Force, known as the Whiz Kids. Guys who would bring fresh ideas and a military-like ethos to the company. In his first five years, Hank would turn things around by introducing several new changes, fully revitalizing every aspect of Ford Motors. It was clear to everybody at the company that Hank meant business, and his restructuring bet immediately paid off. In 1946, only one year after Ford was losing millions every week, just by restructuring the company's management and removing redundancies, he managed to turn Ford around and actually generate $2,000 in profit. A drop in the bucket, to be sure, but still a monumental achievement given the catastrophic state of the company at the time. And he generated this profit with no new cars to generate this money, just pure cost-cutting savings internally. But mere stability wasn't enough. Hank still had plenty of work to do if he wanted to lift Ford to the incredible heights it once enjoyed. In 1947, Ford introduced its first post-war models, which included sleek, modern designs with improved features and performances. These new cars marked a significant departure from the pre-war designs. Notable models included the Ford Super Deluxe and the Ford Sportsman Convertible. And in 1948, Hank unveiled the Ford F-Series, pickup trucks not sold to companies, but to individuals, a huge step forward in Ford's post-war transformation. The F-Series would evolve into one of the most successful and enduring vehicle lines in automotive history, becoming a symbol of American workhorse reliability. By the end of 1949, Ford Motors was now turning a profit of over $250 million a year and Henry Ford II was no longer seen as a privileged kid with a famous name. He was now seen as a legitimate business tycoon alongside Howard Hughes and Nelson Rockefeller. As much as Hank did for taking Ford Motors into the post-war effort by relaunching the company, the 50s would be the decade that really moved Ford forward into the next generation of automobile making. Henry Ford II was adamant about improving the quality of Ford vehicles. Under his leadership, Ford implemented rigorous quality control measures to ensure that his cars were built to last. 
Hank oversaw the development of new technologies, such as automatic transmissions, power steering, and power brakes, which were integrated into Ford vehicles. These innovations made Ford cars more comfortable and appealing to consumers. Finding the next big thing in such a competitive industry was no small feat, and it wasn't like the consumer public had an idea of what they wanted in a modern car. His grandfather once said, if I asked people what they wanted, they would have told me faster horses. In the 1950s, Ford had a few home runs right out of the gates. Besides the Crestline and the Country Squire, the company released Lincoln and Mercury models that all caught the public's attention. The following year was even better, propelling Ford to the number two spot in the industry, overtaking their longtime rival Chrysler. And to be clear, though General Motors was still the number one company, and still twice as big as Ford, Hank was twice as powerful as any chairman at GM. Where GM got a new chairman every five years, Hank ran Ford for 33 years. And while there's no single shareholder who controls GM, Hank, with the help of his brothers and sisters' shares, owned nearly all of Ford. But still, Hank wanted more out of the Ford company, demanding the very best to honor his family's legacy. In 1955, Ford introduced the Fairlane and the Thunderbird, their first attempt at a sports car, and they were huge hits. And the following year, Hank officially took Ford public. At the time, it was the largest IPO in American history. With more than 10 million shares, an evaluation of 658 million, the Ford Motor Company IPO of 1956, led by Goldman Sachs, was the largest common stock offering to date. Henry Ford would have been rolling over in his grave if he knew that the company he fought so hard to keep private was now publicly owned. But Hank was the Mr. Ford now, leaving his grandfather and his Model T in the dust. But the road to glory is often a bumpy ride, as not all of Hank's ideas were stellar. In 1957, he ordered the design of a car meant to appeal to the above average Joe. Meant to compete with the Oldsmobile, Ford Motors rushed the vehicle into production and kept the project under wraps, struggling with what to call it. Ultimately, the decision fell on Henry Ford II to name the car. Defying all his marketing experts, he chose to name the car after his late father, Etzel. The model underperformed significantly. Rather than hitting the 200,000 unit benchmark, it struggled to make half that number, leading to Ford losing a staggering $250 million. And even worse, the name Edsel would now be synonymous in the auto industry as Dud. It was a heavy blow. In 1957, Ford released the Falcon, the very first mainstream compact car. With small, fuel-efficient vehicles taking America by storm, Hank had identified a gap in the market and managed to make a tidy profit on the venture, selling over 400,000 units in its first year of launch. And Hank continued to find his footing with the introduction of the Ford Galaxy in 1959. But one thing that doesn't get talked about enough is his global expansion. Recognizing the importance of the international market, in 1956, Ford of Europe was established, marking Ford's entry into the European market. This move allowed Ford to cater to the specific needs and preferences of European consumers, while also leveraging local talent and resources. By the time Hank would leave Ford, there would be Ford operations in more than 30 countries, ranging from Great Britain to Malaysia. Nineteen sixty started off with a bit of a twist, as Hank the Deuce stepped away as president of Ford Motors. However, he didn't step down. He stepped up, becoming chairman of the Ford Motor Company, a position that gave him more power over any new incoming president. And for the next 20 years, the role of president would be a revolving door of businessmen, all reporting to Hank, including one of his own whiz kids, Robert McNamara, the first non-Ford to ever be named president. Robert would ironically leave after only two months to become the Secretary of Defense under President John F. Kennedy. One thing Hank the Deuce did learn from his grandfather was that the best publicity you could have for a car was to win races. And Henry wanted Ford Motors to be known in the racing world. However, at the time, the fastest cars in the world were not from America. They were from Europe. And in the early 1960s, they were mostly named Ferrari. The easy solution was to buy Ferrari, a racing juggernaut that was focused on winning first and producing cars second. As Ford put his plan together, it seemed perfect. Ford would acquire a flashy, struggling company 
that would attract a new generation who wanted something fast and edgy. Once negotiations started, Enzo Ferrari himself seemed to like the deal, as he was becoming tired of having to handle the day-to-day -day dealings of the company. Negotiations continued for months. In the spring of 1963, Ford and Ferrari seemed on the verge of closing the deal. The Ford offer came with a caveat. Enzo would have to give up control of the budget. In turn, this would mean Enzo would no longer have the complete say over the Ferrari racing team. But this clause in the deal was too much for Enzo. Winning on the track was Enzo's legacy, the one thing he held dear to his heart that he would never give up, not even for millions of dollars. In the last moments, Ferrari pulled out of the deal. Ugliness ensued. Instead of merely retracting from the deal, Enzo seemed to be personally affronted by the offer. Enzo Ferrari communicated to Henry Ford II that he would never sell under those conditions. He called the company ugly. He called Ford cars ugly, and the factory in which they were built ugly. It's also rumored that Enzo went after Henry Ford II personally, making comments about how his grandfather had been a much better man than he was, and that the real Henry Ford was dead leaving Henry Ford II as a poor, unfit replacement. Enzo then turned around and sold a major chunk of his Ferrari stock to Fiat. Henry Ford II was furious, and he sought revenge on the racetrack. The portrayal of Enzo seemed to create a kind of a perfect storm for Ford. Sales were lacking, multiple failures had happened publicly, and now a major deal had fallen through that was supposed to revitalize the brand. And not only had the deal fallen through, it happened on the global stage. Henry Ford had been insulted, bamboozled, and humiliated, and Enzo had targeted one of Henry Ford II's main insecurities, that he hadn't lived up to his grandfather's reputation. Transforming his anger into motivation, Henry Ford set out to get revenge on Enzo Ferrari. He would stop at nothing to beat Ferrari at Ferrari's most winning race, the 24 Hours in Le Mans. Ford would build a vehicle that would not only compete with Ferrari, but dominate it. Their target was Ferrari's prized and prestigious car race, the 24 Hours in Le Mans, a day-long race of speed and endurance in France. Ford quickly set out to humiliate them on a global stage. Ford gave the task of building the Ferrari killer to the Advanced Vehicles Group division in the United Kingdom. There, the origins of the legendary GT40 were born. Designers were using an engine that had been built by Ford's experimental team in Dearborn, Michigan. The first GT40 models were fast, but also dangerous. Though they succeeded in producing great speed, the general design lacked the reliability and safety needed for the 24 hours in Le Mans. Ford, being brand new to the racing world, was struggling to build a vehicle that could compete in the harsh conditions. The GT40 needed to be stable enough to run continuously for 24 hours and have the speed and handling to win. The first two races Ford entered to compete with Ferrari, the 64 and 65 Le Mans, were failures. Ford lost to Ferrari both times. Facing a third round of defeats, Ford needed a new angle. They needed a race team with experience in racing and a keen eye for design. Ford put all his chips behind the only American to ever win in Le Mans, automotive designer Carroll Shelby. And in 1966, Ford finally beat Ferrari in Le Mans. Around the same time, one of the crowning achievements of Henry Ford II's era was the introduction of the Ford Mustang in 1964. This iconic American muscle car was a radical departure from the conventional Ford models and ignited a sensation in the automotive world. The Mustang offered a perfect blend of performance, style, and affordability, appealing to a broad range of consumers, and it quickly became a symbol of American automotive innovation, and it remains an enduring classic. Henry Ford II's reign in the 1970s proved to be just as strong as the 60s, filled with big highs and even bigger lows. Ford's hits in the early 70s included the Granada, the Landau, and the Maverick. However, the big miss of the 70s came in the form of a Ford compact version of the Mustang, a smaller car called the Pinto. The Pinto had done well in its introduction. In fact, Henry Ford II was even said to have driven a Pinto runabout as his preferred car. 
However, the safety reputation of the Pinta was ruined when its fuel tank design attracted both media and government scrutiny after several deadly fires related to the tanks rupturing in rear-end collisions. Though the buck did stop with Hank the Deuce, the real casualty was Ford President Lee Iacocca, whom Hank fired for seemingly no reason. If you looked at Ford Motors in the late 70s, it was clear it looked nothing like his grandfather's company, with dozens of models and options and colors. But Ford began facing another enemy, the EPA. Due to the gas crisis of the late 70s, Hank and his team had to begin finding ways to make their iconic cars more fuel efficient, without losing the hardcore lovers of their vehicles. And by the end of the decade, in 1979, Hank, age 63, decided that his three plus decades running Ford was enough. It was time to discuss a replacement. It was widely expected that Henry Ford II would be handing down the company to another Ford, including either his own son, Edsel Ford II, or his nephew, Benson Ford Jr., both of whom were Ford shareholders and expected to continue the Ford dynasty. However, a stockholder meeting turned contentious when Hank the Deuce announced that he would not support another Ford to take over the company. There are no crown princes in the Ford Motor Company, and there is no privilege route to the top, he said. He felt that Benson Jr. and even his own son were not qualified to take over Ford. He added that the Ford family members who were qualified to work for the company will have a competitive edge to do so, but that ownership of Ford family stock is not a passport to a top position. For the first time in the history of the company, when Henry Ford II retired, there was no person named Ford running Ford Motors. Hank spent a quiet retirement starting in 1980 after marrying his third wife, Kathleen, whom it turned out he had been having an affair with for five years prior while married to his second wife, Maria Christina. In 1983, he was inducted into the Automotive Hall of Fame, and sadly in 1987, at the age of only 70, Hank passed away from pneumonia. Hank is the chief reason Ford is an iconic name to this day. While his grandfather laid the first stone, Hank built the temple. Hank the Deuce was the third generation of Fords, and today there are five generations. And if you're interested in how the Ford family has branched out around the globe, be sure to check out this video here on the five generations of Ford that you can watch right now. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel to see more content like this, and hit the bell icon so you don't miss another video. I'll see you in the next one.